Today we are going to talk about the female reproductive system. The system develops just like the male system during the intrauterine life. So in an embryo, the entire female reproductive system is developed by the time of birth. And then it stays in a dormant state till puberty. At puberty, under the influence of hormones released by the pituitary gland, the gonadotropins, the, the female gonads start showing the cyclic changes along with the duct system. So I'm going to show you the gross anatomy of the female reproductive system. Here in front of us is a model showing us all the components of a female reproductive system. So the, the, the major component is a right ovary and a left ovary. And these are the female gonads. Then we'll talk about the duct system. The duct system is composed of the fallopian tubes, a right and a left fallopian tube, which is also known as the uterine tube. Then a central organ, which is known as the uterus or the womb. Then the uterus continues into a tubular structure, which is known as vagina, and that leads to the exit through the body, okay? So again, I will repeat, the female reproductive system is composed of gonads, that is ovaries, the duct system includes the fallopian or the uterine tubes, a centrally placed uterus, and a vagina. In front of you is a real plastinated specimen of a female body showing us the pelvic cavity as well as the abdominal cavity. So we are concerned with the pelvic cavity at this moment. You can see this is how the female reproductive tract or system has been placed inside the pelvic cavity. In front of us is this, this part of the uterus, which is the fundus. On either side, you can see these are the two fallopian tubes which are running <clears throat> in the folds of broad ligament. And here you can see, I will lift it up. This is the ovary, this one. Okay, it's been plastered against the fallopian tube, but this, this is the left ovary. And the right ovary is not that much visible, but we have to imagine that it's lying here. In fact, it's pretty much obvious over here. Okay, so the right and the left and right ovaries the left and right fallopian tubes, the tubes are opening into the body of uterus, which is present in the center. It's an unpaired structure, which is a part of the female duct system, and we, we also call it an organ. It's a, it's a fibromuscular organ. Here you can see anterior to the uterus is the bladder, which is not visible because it is lying under the cover of the peritoneum. At the back of the uterus is the rectum, which is the terminal part of the digestive tract. Okay, we will revisit this specimen when we will be talking about the details of the relations, but this is how these com components of the female reproductive system are placed in, the, in a female pelvic cavity. During the intrauterine life, the, the two ovaries are developing along with the kidneys in the lumbar region. And just like the testes, they will also be descending down to their final destination or their adult position, which is in the pelvic cavity. Okay, so 
here in front of us is a body of an adult female, but we have to imagine that this is the posterior wall and these are the kidneys and this is the lumbar region. Here you can imagine that the two right and left ovaries are developing on either side of the vertebral column, medial to the developing kidneys. Okay, so the kidneys, uh, as they, they develop in different steps, one of the steps is the intermediate state, which is mesonephric state. The mesonephroi will eventually degenerate because the permanent and adult form kidneys will be developing from a different source, which is metanephros. Once the, the meso, mesonephros on each side would, would be regressing, it's going to leave a, 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 the mesentery, which was lying between the mesonephros and the posterior body wall, as it is. That mesentery will shrink and will give rise to a cord-like structure on each side that is known as gubernaculum, that's present in both male and female embryos. We are talking about the female. So the, that gubernaculum is, is like, a, like a cord, a linear cord, which is its, its proximal end or the cranial end will be attached to the lower pole of the developing ovary and the caudal or the distal end of the gubernaculum will be attached to the future uh, labia majora or the perineal region, okay? Now imagine that the two gubernacula, they are regressing in size. And the way they will regress, they will be pulling the ovaries down along with them. At the same time, simultaneously, the lower body, the, the, the caudal end of the embryonic body is also growing down, expanding. So by these two uh, things happening, with these two things happening, the ovaries will be descending. And ultimately, they will reach to their adult position, which is lying between the bifurcation of the, the right, and, right and left common iliac arteries. So there, there would be the ovarian fossae. There are the ovarian fossae on each side at the bifurcation, at the point of bifurcation of the external and internal iliac. Like the common iliac is bifurcating into an internal iliac and an external iliac, and in, in between is a fossa for the ovary. These are the final positions of ovary. Now I'll show you on an illustration how that is happening and what would be uh, happening to the gubernaculum ultimately. So look at this illustration. It's the same which I just have explained to you briefly. These are the two ovaries and they were lying in the lumbar region on either side of the lumbar vertebrae. And these are the cord-like extensions or structures which are known as gubernacula. Okay. Uh, with the process of apoptosis going on inside the embryonic body, the, the, the gubernaculum will start shrinking, regressing, resorbing, bringing the ovaries down step by step till the time, like in the last uh, few months of intrauterine life, the ovaries will reach their destination that is just below the pelvic inlet within the false pelvis they will be lying, okay? The, by the way, the ovaries are um, just not, not in the false pelvis, I'm sorry, it, they, are, they will be lying in just at the, underneath the pelvic brim or pelvic inlet within the lesser pelvis or true pelvis, okay? This was the cord. Now what happened in the adult life, the, the remnants of gubernaculum on each side will be visible as a ligament which is lying between the ovary and the fundus of the uterus. That is known as the round ligament of ovary. And the remaining part of the gubernaculum, because as you remember that it was attached to the lower pole of the ovary and the, 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 the distal end of the gubernaculum was attached to the labia majora, the future labia majora of the baby. So the portion, uh, 
the portion which is attached to the lateral wall of the uterus then passes through the inguinal canal by passing through the deep inguinal ring entering the canal and then exiting the superficial inguinal ring and attaching over the uh, undersurface of labia majora. This whole portion of the gubernaculum is known as the round ligament of uterus and we will discuss the role of round ligament of uterus in the adult female. It's playing a very important role when it comes to the supports of the uterus. But if, if I say that the contents, one of the most important contents of the inguinal canal in females is the round ligament of uterus, I would be wrong. So to sum it up, the gubernaculum of the embryonic life remains in our body in the form of round ligament of ovary and the round ligament of uterus. Each ovary is roughly of almond shape and when it comes to the size of the ovary, it's three centimeters long, two centimeters wide, and one centimeter in thickness. So the formula is three, two, one. Three is the length, two is the width, and one is the thickness. So we can imagine how small these gonads are. The ovary is not covered by peritoneum. Instead of peritoneum, there is a, a thin layer of epithelium that is covering the surface, the outer surface of each ovary. That epithelium is known as the germinal epithelium. It's made up of simple cuboidal cells. Okay? The, this is a misnomer because in old times they used to think there was a misconception that uh, the, the epithelium lining the ovaries is responsible for the production of germ cells. So they started naming it uh, germinal epithelium. Although now we know that the germinal epithelium has nothing to do with the production of germ cells. They, the, they are present in the cortex of the ovary. Nothing to do with the surface epithelium. But uh, we have to know this fact that the peritoneum is not covering the ovaries. The ovaries are lying. They are actually lying behind and they are suspended in the peritoneal cavity not covered by peritoneum, okay? How they are suspended, uh, I'm showing you the model of the reproductive system, female reproductive system from behind. Like this is the posterior view through the system or the dorsal aspect. Here you can see that the ovaries are lying behind the uh, the folds of a ligament which is known as broad ligament I will show you in a few minutes uh, they are not connected to the uterus through any duct just like the testes are connected but they are suspended by the folds of mesenteries so the the mesentery which is well, like if if you imagine my hand is the posterior body wall and the board is representing the anterior body wall okay so the the region of the mesentery which is lying between the posterior surface of the ovary and the the posterior body wall is known as the meso ovarium that meso ovarium through that meso ovarium the ovaries are anchored they are uh, you know uh, stabilized in the peritoneal cavity while the, this portion of the broad ligament which is it's it's like it's suspending the ovaries okay this is known as the suspensory ligament of ovary on each side okay this is an expansion or the extension of broad ligament it's present within the broad ligament so I would say the suspensory ligament of each ovary is a part of broad ligament. 
what role the suspensory ligament is playing? It's holding the, the nerves and blood vessels which are coming towards the ovaries and getting out of the ovaries. Okay? Here we can appreciate this, this rounded fold enfolding, uh, which is the round ligament of ovary we just have talked about. All right? So I will show you in another model how the, the fallopian tubes are hugging each ovary on either side. So if you look from sideways, this is the anterior view and the bladder. And here on each side of the uterus are the two fallopian tubes. And each fallopian tube is like a, you know, it's hugging the ovary on each side. It's not attached upon that. Each fallopian tube is not attached over the ovary, but it's just touching. Okay? So I would say that the ovary, each ovary is lying in the curve of each fallopian tube. So on this drawing, you can see that the, the, the ovary, if we, if we section the ovary longitudinally and we cut it open, we can, we can have a look at the, the solid structure from inside. That it's composed of, like any other gland in the body, it's composed of a central or the inner region, which is pretty much poorly defined in, in an ovary, that is known as the medulla and a thicker outer region, which is known as the cortex. Like any other gland, we have a cortex and a medulla. The medulla is having, its, you, can, you can appreciate the fact that the medulla is mainly uh, containing the blood vessels, the, the capillary networks, the nerves, which are going to serve this, uh, this organ or this gland. While the cortex, in an ovary uh, is laden with the follicles, we call them ovarian follicles. As I mentioned in the beginning, that at the time of puberty, once the, 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 the release of gonadotropin starts from the pituitary gland, this, the cells or these uh, follicles present are, are embedded in the substance or the interstitium of cortex will show growth. So as we know that the ovaries were originally, they were developing in the lumbar region. From there, they received the blood supply through abdominal aorta. So a, a direct branch of abdominal aorta, the ovarian artery, in case of females, will be supplying the ovary. So the ovarian artery, once the ovary will start descending on each side, it will be pulling its blood supply with it down to the pelvic cavity. So you can see here, uh, let me explain the relations a little bit. So these are, this is the network of ovarian artery and vein, and it's very much closely related to the ureter, which is the part of urinary system. So the, uh, on the right side, the right ovarian vein and the artery will be crossing the ureter from front, okay, just before entering the pelvic cavity. Now I move the model and you can, you can have a look at the back of the uterus on either side because this is just a hemi section or the sagittal, mid sagittal section through the uh, female pelvis, but we can have a look at one ovary, okay. so. This ovary, uh, the right ovary, is, is covered by the fimbriated end of the right fallopian tube and it's lying at the bifurcation. So this is the one common iliac, the right common iliac, which is bifurcating into a right external iliac and a right internal iliac. So this fossa between the, within the bifurcation of common iliac has been occupied by the ovary. And here we can appreciate that the ureter on each side is related. It's, it's passing by close to the ovary. And there is another structure, a nervous structure, which is also present close to the ovarian fossa on each side. That's the obturator nerve. 
the nerve which is taking origin just like the femoral nerve from the lumbar plexus and will be going down to supply the medial aspect or medial compartment of the lower limb or thigh. That nerve is in close contact with the ovarian fossa. So in case of any inflammation within the ovary, over the surface of ovary, um, most, of, most common is the, uh, at the time of ovulation when the surface, of, surface epithelium of ovary is bulging or the graphene follicle is bulging out of the cortex, it's, it's edematous and that can lead to the mid-cycle pain or the pain of ovulation. Okay. Sometimes during a surgical procedure on the ovary, the, uh, the obturator nerve can get damaged because it's in line close to the ovarian fossa. In many ovarian conditions, this nerve is the one which would be affected. Okay, now we will talk about the, the first element of the female duct system. And in front of us is a model showing it in, you know, in a magnified form. Uh, the right and left fallopian tubes or the uterine tubes. And in the center is the uterus. So we'll discuss the details, the anatomical details of the uterine tube. Each uterine tube is a muscular uh, tube, a fibromuscular tube, and it's connecting, actually it's not connecting, but it is lying in close proximity of each ovary and receiving the product of the ovary, which is the ovum, or the oocyte, along with its coverings, and transporting that ovum to the uterine cavity. So we can say that the, the fallopian tube or the uterine tube is the connection between the ovary or the gonad and the uterus, which is the receptacle or, or the, the, the house for a developing offspring, okay? So we'll talk about the parts of the fallopian tube. It is divided into four regions. The first, which is lying close to the, the lateral most region, which is lying close to the ovaries, is the infundibulum. This is the first region or part of the fallopian tube. You can appreciate the fact that the infundibulum is like it's an open end, okay? So it's lying, it's, it's actually opening into the peritoneal cavity, okay? So one end of the fallopian tube is opening into the peritoneal cavity and the other end is opening into the uterine cavity. So the infundibulum is having like in the ends, it is having finger-like projections. These projections are known as fimbriae. And these fimbriae are, you know, they are lying close by to ovaries. And one of the fimbriae, fimbriae is like a finger, it's attached, it's too long, and it is attached on the surface epithelium of the ovary. And they are ready to receive the ovulated product of the ovary. That is the ovum with the follicular cells and like the cumulus oophorus they will be receiving, okay? So keep this fact in your mind that one end of the fallopian tube is opening into the peritoneal cavity and the other end is opening in the uterine cavity. After infundibulum, fimbriae and infundibulum, the second largest and the broadest part of the uterine tube or the region of the uterine tube is the ampullary region or ampulla, okay? The ampulla is the longest, it's the largest and the widest. That has been followed by isthmus, the region which is narrowest. By the way, in this model, the entire section through the fallopian tube looks like it's like a, of one uh, width, which is not the fact. The infundibulum is like a funnel, okay, with the fimbriae. Then the ampulla is the dilated portion. 
then isthmus is the narrowest part of the fallopian tube. And isthmus has been continued itself as the intramural or the interstitial part of the fallopian tube, which is the smallest. And it's why it's known as intramural, because it's traversing through the, the wall of the uterus and it's entering, or it's, as an opening, it will be ending up into the uterine cavity. Okay? Fimbriae in fundibulum, the ampulla, the isthmus, and the intramural part or the interstitial part of the fallopian tube. Let me tell you, because we know that the fallopian tube or the uterine tube is playing a very important role in the process of fertilization, in the process of ovulation, uh, like in, not ovulation, in the process of the establishment of menstruation. So uh, it's like, uh, it's, it's one of the most vital parts of the entire tract. So as we know that fallopian tube is a connection between the, the ovary and the uterus, it is playing a very important role in fertilization because the sperm will climb up and will cross the ostium, the opening of the fallopian tube and will enter the cavity of the tube, a narrow slit-like cavity of the tube. And as we know that the tube is made up of smooth muscle fibers, these muscles will be contracting like, like any uh, collection of the smooth muscles, like as, a, as an example we have in GIT, they, there would be a movement which is known as peristalsis. So the peristaltic motion of the, uh, the walls of the uterine tube will compel the sperms up and lateral towards the the uh, ampullary end of the, or the ampullary region of the uterine tube. Here, the, in the ampulla, because it, this is the widest part of the fallopian tube, the fertilization is, usually takes place in this region or in this part. So, uh, through the ostium to the ampulla is the journey of sperm. From the ampulla, after fertilization, or even without fertilizer, if any fertilized or unfertilized ovum has to pass down to the uterine ca cavity from the surface of the ovary, it will pass down through the uh, uterine tube into the uterine cavity. Okay, so in case of fertilization, the, the fertilized ovum or the zygote will be traveling down uh, up and medial okay up and medial it will go and will move with the, with the ciliary movement because the when we'll talk about the the uh, uh, the microscopic anatomy of the uterine tube we will discuss the lining epithelium and everything but but at this moment you should know that uh, the mucosa the innermost lining of the uterine tube is having a lot of cilia with the ciliary mo movement the, the fertilized ovum or the unfertilized ovum will move towards the, the ostium of the uh, uterine tube, okay? Keeping this functional significance in mind, we can easily imagine what will happen in case of the blockade of this tube. That can result into secondary infertility. One of the most common causes of secondary infertility is the uh, scarring of the, the uterine tube. That can happen in any acute or chronic bacterial infection. That condition is known as salpingitis because salping means a tube. So a condition in which there would be inflammation of the inner lining of the tube will be known as salpingitis. So there would be, there can be an acute salpingitis or a chronic salpingitis. As a result, there would be excessive scar tissue formation as a result of like uh, the, the, the end result of inflammation, chronic inflammation may lead to uh, scar tissue formation. So there would be, especially uh, in, in, the, in the lumen, there would be too much adhesions that will lead to obstruction. Other than 
in infertility uh, there is a condition which is known as ectopic pregnancy the normal site of pregnancy is the uterine cavity but if it is not happening and it's not placed within the uterine cavity it's been placed in some other spot that's known as a ectopic so as a result of chronic salpingitis there can be an, uh, the chances of ectopic pregnancy and mostly that pregnancy can, the pregnancy sac or the gestational sac can be found in the ampullary region of the fallopian tube where the fertilization took place so you can imagine if there are scar tissues uh, closing the 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 downward passage of um, the fallopian tube it would stop the conceptus or the gestational sac to move down it will that will result into the implantation within the mucosa of the ampulla and that may lead to uh, many complications first of all the you can see you can compare the, the the difference between the the lining as well as the musculature of the fallopian or the uterine tube and the uterus itself the uterus is is has been made for this purpose it has a lot of, a great collection of smooth muscle fibers and that will be expanding all the time but here in the fallopian tube even if it is in the ampullary region if the if the gestational sac gets implanted in the ampulla there would won't be any much room available for the expansion as the sac will grow in size the other thing the other difference would be the lining epithelium it's not lined the, the tube is not lined by endometrium which is an exclu exclusive type of uh, epithelium. It's lined by simple columnar epithelium, which is just providing a little bit support. So there are chances of rupture, okay? So there would be, as I, I just mentioned, that the fallopian tube is covered, it's lined by the round ligament, and its, it's open end is actually, it's facing the peritoneal cavity. So there would be huge, hemorrhage that can be that can be a result of uh, a ruptured ectopic pregnancy normally in in case of ectopic pregnancy uh, the the female who's who's gen in general terms is the, is a young uh, uh, you know 10 uh, 15 20 year old girl she can suffer from an ectopic pregnancy and that uh, uh, the pain of ectopic pre pregnancy usually imitates the pain of appendicitis and that can be misdiagnosed. That happens most of the times that the girl is suffering from an ectopic pregnancy while the doctor is thinking that she's suffering from appendicitis because the pain is pretty much the same, okay? In front of us is an illustration. And here you can see that this purple sheet is representing the double layered ligament which is broad ligament and so this structure is the fallopian tube and this is the fimbriated end of the fallopian tubes with the infantibulum which are lying outside the fold of broad ligament while the rest of the tube is under the cover and it's reaching and opening up into the uterine canal or uterine cavity the, the blood supply when it comes to the blood supply of the fallopian or the uterine, uterine tubes the tubes are receiving a dual blood supply. The artery which is supplying the ovary, the ovarian artery, will give off branches to the uh, uh, uterine tube, as well as in the folds of broad ligament on the sides of uterus, you can see the uterine artery is climbing up and it's supplying the organ, the uterus, as well as it's sending off ascending branches. They are also known as the tubal branches of the uterine artery. They, all of them are present within the folds of broad ligament. So the, the uterine tube is receiving a rich anastomosis, supplying it, because it's a very important element of the female reproductive system. So it's receiving a very rich blood supply through the ovarian artery, branches of the ovarian artery, and the branches of the uterine artery, together will form a, a rich network of anast uh, blood vessels or anastomosis, and will supply the walls of the muscular walls as well as the mucosa of the 
uterine tube. The veins that will be draining along with the path, they will follow the pathway of the arteries. So uh, they will the the, 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 vein, the veins of the the veins draining the fallopian tubes will ultimately be following the venous plexus of the uterine uh, vein. Here in front of you, there is a makeshift model showing us the the largest ligament in the pelvic cavity, which is the broad ligament. And uh, my arm is the fallopian tube. And I'm holding the ovary. And I want you to be oriented uh, that by, the, by this model, that my shoulder is, suppose this is the uterus. And this is the, uh, the fixed end of the broad ligament, which is attached on, on the lateral wall of the uterus. And this is the free end of the broad ligament. And here I can show you that the ligament is composed of two layers, an anterior layer and a posterior layer, okay? So the anterior layer is facing the, the, the whiteboard and the posterior layer of the broad ligament is facing the camera. And I want you to appreciate the relationship between the ovary and the broad ligament. So the ovary is, is being suspended close to the posterior layer of the broad ligament. It's lying behind the broad ligament. Okay, so it's lying between the posterior body wall and the posterior layer of the broad ligament. And my fingers, as well as my hand, my hand is the infundibular end of the, the fallopian tube. And my fingers are the fimbria. So one of the fimbria, fimbria is, is touching the ovary. So you can appreciate that the entire length of the fallopian tube is covered by this double layered ligament, the broad ligament. It's under the cover of the broad ligament, except for the infundibulum and the fimbriae. So the fimbriated end of the fallopian tube is opening up into the peritoneal cavity. Okay?